I think most of my viewers can relate to the feeling of needing some piece of hardware, going for the cheaper option because you think you just don't need the bells and whistles of the more expensive brands or models, only to realize later that the cheap model you got has an important limitation that prevents you from fully taking advantage of it or using it as you imagined it. Let me give you a practical example because recently I thought I would add UPS backup to my smart home system which includes my Wi-Fi router, a Raspberry Pi running home assistant and a fiber TV media converter from the telco provider. Generally speaking, power delivery is very good quality and stable where I live, hardly any interruptions, but as everywhere else, it's not 100% bulletproof. And in the few occasions in the past when I've experienced a uh, power outage uh, it was not really an outage it was mostly just a one two uh, second brief interruption but that was enough for the equipment to reset luckily everything was back to normal after boot in a few minutes however i don't like the feeling that something like a one or two second brief power interruption could lead for example to my raspberry pi with home assistant running my smart home system to get corrupted and not boot anymore I do have backups, I could probably restore everything in a couple of hours, but things hardly go as planned when bad things happen uh, and you need to recover something. So I would very much prefer to have some protection against these types of events uh, so I don't have to debug it afterwards. So I decided to install a UPS to keep these things running in the unfortunate event of a power outage and to allow them to gracefully shut down when the bat battery is depleted. I thought I don't need any special features, my load is very low, so the most basic, uh, you know, 600 VA UPS with a USB interface that comes new with warranty should do the job. So I ended up choosing this uh, Sirius uh, 600 Li, which is a basic 600 VA rated line interactive type UPS with two Shuko sockets on the back and a USB interface for status. It's the most basic model with just a few LEDs on the front and an on-off button. Exactly what I needed. I paid just 40 euros for this, which I thought was a very good deal. And to be clear here, Sirio is just another brand name. I seriously doubt they manufacture anything. Uh, some already established UPS factory in Shenzhen probably makes this and just rebrands it for a multitude of these no-name brands across the globe. So the very same hardware could be in your cheap uh, UPS as well. And just a short interruption in my story here. I know some of you are wondering if I thought about building a DIY custom UPS that would just drive my devices with DC voltage from a set of lithium batteries. Yes, I have thought about that many times and I think it's a very interesting project. Unfortunately, my unified Dream router runs directly off AC with an internal power supply. So that makes it very difficult to implement such a project because I would also have to integrate an inverter which complicates things a lot. And this is generally a, a complication that is valid with any type of networking gear that does POE because you know they need voltages in the 50 volt range at the input to be able to do that POE. So I got the UPS, installed it, uh, it feeds into this extension socket which feeds all of my devices. It all looked good so I proceeded with setting up NAT and if you're not familiar with NAT it's short for Network UPS Tools. It's an open source project and they have an add-on for Home Assistant to allow your smart home to manage the UPS and create automations based on that. NAT basically knows how to talk to your UPS to get information about its status and it knows how to talk to other devices over the network to let them know about what's happening so they can decide how to act. NAT supports pretty much any UPS out there, it's a project with a large community and if you're running a brand name UPS you are almost certainly going to find plug and play support for your UPS model. Um, However, if you're running a cheap, no-name UPS like myself, well, you'll soon discover that these no-name brands will typically implement an HID interface over USB, but using some generic vendor ID 001 and product ID 0000 values, which make it impossible for NAT to figure out which uh, UPS you're running and select the proper protocol to talk to it. In addition to that, the implementation of the HID protocol can sometimes be buggy which will lead to other problems as I will soon discover. 
So I had to spend some time until I eventually figured out, you know, what combination I need to put into my NAT config to get it to recognize my no name UPS. And that was to um, set it to look for that generic VID PID combination, but to also tell you to use the driver named NAT driver underscore QX. Uh, and with these settings, NAT discovered my UPS and I was now getting into Home Assistant data from my UPS, stuff like the status of the UPS, which can be online, offline, on battery, uh, the loading percentage, the voltages, you know, battery chargers, pretty much everything you need. So I thought that was a difficult journey, but I figured it out in the end. And it was the price I had to pay for going for the cheapest hardware. But little did I know that's not the end of my story, because just a few hours after that initial setup, my UPS sensors went to unknown state. A reboot of the NAT server didn't seem to fix the problem and removing the USB cable and plugging it back into the uh, USB plus a reboot of the NAT server was the right fix. So that's when I started suspecting there is something wrong with the USB connection. And of course I tried a different USB cable and a different USB port on my Raspberry Pi, but that was not the issue. That's when I decided to open the enclosure of the UPS to take a closer look at how the interface is implemented. Turns out the UPS has a modular construction. There is the front panel, which in my case is just push button and some LEDs, but there are models out there that have an LCD. Then there is the main board, which contains the inverter, the battery charging, plus a microcontroller handling everything. And below that we have the battery. And on the back there is this isolated USB interface board, which in this case also has some protection features for a phone line. So I took our USB board out of the UPS and taking a closer look at it, we see there are, you know, four wires coming in from the main board. So I immediately thought this must be a serial connection, uh, some sort of TX RX power and ground that then goes through some uh, optocouplers and is converted to a USB interface by this chip with the markings CY7C63813, which is in fact a Infineon slash Cypress 8-bit micro with low speed USB interface. So in other words, what the UPS manufacturer has done here is to take a legacy UPS design, which uh, has had a serial interface for like forever and upgraded that to a USB interface by implementing some basic HID protocol um, inside this micro. However, this is likely, you know, badly uh, implemented because it uses those generic VID PID values. And on top of that, it seems to be buggy because it just locks up after a while. But this is a very simple device performing a rather simple function. And I'm an electrical engineer, so I am perfectly capable of designing a battery replacement. So I took some of the uh, physical measurements of the existing board and I started designing a replacement PCB, which would be plug and play. I would need it to take the, the same JST PH4 pin connector uh, input with the serial um, connection, uh, which in the process I discovered is just a basic 9600 8N1 baud rate. I would then need to isolate that interface through some form of optocouplers to make everything safe. And then finally convert it to USB uh, with the same connector for easy connection to my Raspberry Pi and easy installment into the original UPS enclosure. So for the isolation, I went with the CMTB121 from Hope RF. This is a nice isolator chip because it operates over a wide operating voltage with a 100 megabit data rate and contains two opposite channels that I need for TX and RX all in a single chip um, and very for affordable. Then for the USB interface, I use the same Silicon Lab CP2102N that I use in my Volink adapters, except that I, reconfig I reconfigured it to use the internal 3.3 uh, volt reg regulator, which also powers the isolator chip to keep the number of external components to a minimum. I had added some minimal ESD protection on the USB side. I use the same USB type B connector that the original board uses and the same mechanical mounting point in the form of these metal threaded um, PCB through hole connectors. The whole PCB was uh, mechanically designed to carefully match the dimensions and the position of the connectors as per the original module. So um, to ensure it would fit the original enclosure. 
project was done using KiCad, and if you're interested in taking a closer look at it, maybe modifying it to your needs, it's open source and you'll find the link to the GitHub rep repository in the description of the video. And within a couple of weeks, I had five of these boards delivered and I, I was ready to test. As you can see, they uh, turned out great and I went for this red color uh, so that it would uh, stand out. And uh, if anyone take, uh, opens up the UPS, they would immediately notice that this is not the standard PCB coming uh, with the UPS. I did not include the phone line protection stuff because I just don't need that. I don't use that. And after getting the uh, PCBs almost 100% uh, assembled from the supplier, all I had to do is to uh, just populate the uh, mechanical mounting point, which goes on here. Now, a quick check with the UPS panel, uh, back panel showed that it fits perfectly. But now let's get back to actually you know, testing these and getting them up and running. Remember that previously our UPS was being discovered through some sort of HID implementation. But now, because we have the um, CP2102 USB to serial converter chip on there, this guy is implementing a different USB interface, which is a virtual serial port and comes with a different default VID and PID. And I won't bore you with all of the details, but it took quite a while to figure out and debug the fact that on my Raspberry Pi running Home Assistant, I have another device, which is a Zigbee to USB bridge that actually appears to be using the same USB to serial chipset with the same default VID PID combination coming from Scilabs, which is a VID 0x10C4, PID 0xEA60. So if you happen to have the Zigbee interface and and you have an add-on like Zigbee 2 MQTT set up to search for that specific VID PID combination to connect to the dongle, you'll run into issues at boot by having two devices with the same VID PID combo present. And in my case, Zigbee 2 MQTT uh, could not figure out uh, which one to connect to. So with this in mind, I knew that I had to set a different VID PID combo for my UPS to avoid this issue. And also within not config, I needed to find a different driver that A knows how to talk over a serial port and B knows the specific protocol that my UPS implements. Now with regards to point number one, setting a different VID PID is not as simple as picking a random value because then a particular driver which is enabling you to use the CP2102N chipset plug and play won't identify and initialize it anymore because that's what drivers do. They look for a VID and PID combination. And in our case, we have a driver that enables us to use the CP2102N as a virtual serial port based on that default VID and PID combo. So after a bit of digging, it turns out that there is actually another PID which you can use and is baked into the default driver. Um, that is EA63 instead of EA60. So if I found this in an application note for um, uh, Scilabs, so you keep the same VID, that's the vendor ID, 10C4, and we config the new PID as EA63, and the driver should still be uh, all good loading uh, the same stuff, and we don't overlap with the other device anymore. So I used this special Scilabs um, Windows app to change the PID to EA63. And while I was there, I also customized the descriptor string to make it something special. Now, when connecting to my Raspberry Pi, the two devices don't overlap anymore. And we noticed the Zigbee USB dongle and my new UPS board both show up fine and things work normally now with Zigbee 2 MQTT. The next step is to find the required NAT driver to talk to my UPS over a serial connection and the required protocol that actually contains the right commands that my UPS understands. And again, after a bit of trial and error, I concluded that NAT driver underscore QX is the right driver uh, for the connection, while the right protocol is Megatech. But just specifying the driver and letting it um, uh, auto-detect the protocol um, was working in my case. And the way I figured this out was to actually connect my UPS with the original board to a Windows PC. I installed the original app they provide and I, uh, the app just happened to provide a, um, 
a debug output where it, it was showing the commands that, that are, are being sent and then I cross-reference those to known protocols inside NOT. And there was one last thing that I needed to do because now we are not using an HID driver in NOT, uh, so we cannot filter by a VID and PID to tell it to which device to connect to because once you tell it to connect via serial, it doesn't look for a VID and PID anymore. So there's a trick uh, to solve that problem. You just use the full Linux uh, device uh, by serial ID path, which you can obtain from within Home Assistant. You go to Settings menu, System, Hardware, and just search through that list to see how it enumerated on your system. So with this new config in place, I was able to successfully start not my UPS got discovered and my problem was finally solved, which obviously brought a great deal of satisfaction. Everything has been running smoothly now for the past month with zero problems. So I can now have automations to shut down my system gracefully when the UPS battery is close to completion and it's running offline. But would I do this again? Absolutely no. The total cost for this project ended up being 61 uh, USD for the five populated boards. And if I would have to count the number of hours I spent debugging the problem and then designing the new board then configuring everything to work it's probably something like 10 hours or more and depending on your hourly hourly rate adding up this extra cost on top of the initial purchase price of the ups and with that you can purchase a very nice high performance brand name ups which is supported out of the box by nut but at the same time the actual knowledge that I gained from this project is priceless and I can tell you for sure that for every project that I have ever designed and built, no matter how small, there's always something useful that I learned, something that I will for sure reuse someday in the future in another project. So while from a uh, financial cost point of view this makes absolutely no sense, from a personal uh, development I'm very happy I did this. And if anyone happens to be interested in any uh, in one of these boards, I still have four of them left, which uh, I have no use for. So I guess I could sell them on my Tindy shop, uh, but I just don't want to add them if uh, no one is interested. So let me know in the comments if you want one. But I have to give you a, a warning. They will uh, just come, you know, flashed with that um, special VID PID combo, which will let them uh, enumerate as a virtual serial port on your system. But beyond that, uh, you likely need to do your own debug um, to see how to um, actually config NAT to talk to your specific UPS, which might not be using the same uh, protocol or driver as my UPS. Uh, so I will offer no support on that. That's entirely on your side to figure out. But as a, uh, a serial to USB interface, this is a very stable one uh, that will guarantee stable operation. I would also be interested in hearing from you guys. Let me know what UPS you're running and if it was a plug and play support with not or generally, let me know what you think about this little project of mine. I'm pretty happy with the end result because uh, now my uh, UPS works just fine with uh, Home Assistant. Thank you for watching and I will be seeing you next time.